sort of started writing for was all, it was a lot better 10 or 15 years ago. It was, uh, and maybe I'm starting to become one of these guys who just said the old days were the best. Mm -hmm. But I think, I actually think the Huffington Post kind of ruined it all, yeah. honestly. Because I think, no, I, I think they, it, no, it had this kind of, um, the idea of the Huffington Post was it was supposed to be a, like a left wing counterweight to, um, you know, to some of the right wing websites. So that was, they thought, but it pretty soon became just kind of, uh, kind of an article that would write feature articles on side boob or something like that, or like celebrity <laughs> mishaps. And they kind of dragged all of online web journalism down, because you have to compete with it. So I was at Slate kind of during that period. I was actually at Slate during that period. And you know, competing with BuzzFeed and, and, uh, and Huffington Post is really, you know, how do you compete with those kind of stories? They, they draw a huge amount of traffic. And not even, they don't even make much money. They just, one thing that annoys me about clickbait and the Huffington Post and BuzzFeed and so forth, they're entertaining, but they do all this. They seize huge amounts of human attention, which is our most valuable resource. I don't know if it would be better if they made a lot of money, but they don't even make that much money. It kind of just gets thrown to the wind. Maybe if they made a bunch of money and they invented something with it, that would be great. But instead it's just kind of, you know, just Lush. a huge waste of, of our collective time. So I think we got to, like, Either reboot the web or abandon the web. That's where I, I think we're at. You know, HTML was cool, and I like Tim Berners-Lee was awesome. He invented it, but it's, it's it, it fostered the main problem is it's never gotten away. So I'm interested in human attention and the quality of our life. As I wrote a book about it, and the web has I, I believe that like concentrated, sort of focused states of attention are desirable, lead to a good a good life, and I believe that kind of constantly being thrown around and it tends to make you, uh, tends to yield distracted, weird, pers unhappiness and not, not, it's okay for some people, but I don't think it's a good way to live. And the web has never really been good at cultivating that sort of more profound, deeper state of, of concentration and, and enjoyment. One of my theories as to why um, the ad-free um, uh, tech companies like uh, Netflix or even Amazon Prime, you know, the, the content have done so well. Is people are trying to get away from being constantly bombarded with, you know, ads and distraction and clicking and so forth. And so they saw this kind of opportunity. It's like maybe what people are craving and yearning right now is like sitting down and watching 10 hours straight of a really immersive <laughs> program with ads. Like, you know, they kind of, they were successful in appealing to a side that was only being served by the film industry, really, but is a really important part of the human media experience. And I think if I were kind of trying to reboot the web, it would be more like, that's more stuff where you get immersed in, in it's, it's deep, as opposed to stuff that's, you know, kind of crazy making and distracting and, yeah. and you know, you sort of feel empty and sick after you spend. Maybe you guys are different, but often, if I click on listicles for like an hour, I feel I don't think it's like feels like great afterwards. No. <laughs> so no, some people might like it. I'm, I'm willing to take uh, dissent from these views. Yeah. yeah. Well, but do you feel like the quality itself of the writing, I guess, inherently has then decreased because of these like web clickbaity type sites? It's too the web is too general to say the quality of the writing is good or bad. There's some great writing uh, going on, but they are fighting the medium. The medium is one. Uh, you know, the remote control had a bad, uh, the remote control is, all, anything that um, makes it too easier to flip away from something, it, it can, um, it's hard to cultivate an immersive experience on. So, let me, that was a very uh, complicated, let me make it more complicated. So, I, I, I believe that in most experiences, different parts of your brain are actually in, um, in, 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 uh, in a kind of a contest. So imagine you're watching TV and it begins to get like a little bit boring or a little bit like you have to work to watch it, you know, like in a drama or something like that. You know, you go, it's going a little. So if, you have a, or watch, if you're watching cable TV, um, if you're in a movie theater, you kind of have to, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> you kind of have to go through it and it might actually end up being a good experience for you. Right? Sometimes, just the same way if you read a you know, a, a book, 
And you know, there are, and you are by yourself and isolated. And sometimes that's a really great experience, even though there's parts that are not pure enjoyment at every moment. You may have that feeling studying <laughs> Miguel. Like, not every moment, but overall it's a worthwhile experience. Most worthwhile experiences have a little bit of suffering or little parts that aren't just candy. I mean, think about things people really care about, like climbing mountains or, or, um, or um, having children or other, other life or most people's serious hobbies. They always have a mixture of enjoyable and unenjoyable parts. And so I like mountain climbing. So I was like, climb out, and I was like, what? That was so painful. Why am I? You know, there were so many parts that were suffering, but then there's these great parts, too. And so getting back to our consumption of media, when you have media that is, whenever there's a little bit of discomfort, you can just click away from it and go to something else, like when you think about channel surfing or web surfing, I think it tends to cultivate more superficial experiences and, you know, leaves us a little bit empty. Uh, and I think there's something deeper. That's why often, I think film has been... Uh, usually a more profound medium than television. Now that's changed in the last 15 years. Why has that changed? Because of television without advertising. Because advertising demand on TV has also always been that you have something that every seven minutes is going to commercial break. So the, or whatever it is. So the writers have to be thinking, all right, how do we get them back from the commercial break? Yeah. Like they're in this constant, and it's a huge, you know, that's why TV sucked for 50 years, I think. I mean, there's occasionally good shows like MASH or whatever. WKRP, Three's Company, I used to like that one. But, but generally speaking, like TV was not really any good for 50 years. All right. <laughs> I um, learned in McGill to make a broad generalization. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good for that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I was looking through your backgrounds and you uh -huh. had, I was stalking you, and um, you said to the New York Times, if I have a life mission, it is to fight bullies yes, and that you right. like standing up for the little guy. I do, yeah. So, I guess, how do you as a lawyer with a strong sense of morality and as a journalist who has this need to report, yeah. respond with people who anonymously comment negative things on, on articles? Like, do you feed the trolls or do you think it's better to kind of step away and take the higher road? Oh, um, I don't think trolls are bullies. I think they're just pathetic. So, I think it's better to go out. Yeah. I mean, trolls are interesting. Because they don't, one thing that's interesting about trolls, trolls, everything's going to go back to my book. So okay. I, in my uh, book about attention, trolls are players in the attentional game. And they are always, it's like a time-honored technique. I was studying the penny papers of the 1830s. And if a paper was like losing circulation, they'd get in a big fight with another editor. Yeah. You know, or they'd say something completely ludicrous or whatever, and they get in these sort of fake fights. You may have noticed this going on in the United States lately. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about politics, but you know, and then everyone goes for it. They love a, a fight. So trolls, uh, the internet trolls, they don't really believe the thing they're saying. They just enjoy getting a rise out of people. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever known, maybe you knew someone in high school or something, who would just say stuff. They really didn't believe it, but they love that shocked expression and like, and they, they fed on that. And yeah. So it's yeah. better to just ignore that. So you don't feed them. Okay. Yes. Well, I guess then moving on from that, how do you think, in a, a positive way, anonymity has like helped people express themselves online? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, I think that it, it's a great, great question. So, I mean, I have a historic answer to this. Yeah. Um, in the late 90s, or when the internet and online spaces, even in, in the 80s and 90s, when online spaces first became <coughs> something people in the audience know a bit about, first became popular, one of the great attractions was this idea that you could transform your identity, be whoever you really felt you were. Why should you be, and there's some logic to this, if, since I learned political theory in this room, if you believe in kind of extreme version of choice and liberalism, you believe, well, why, why am I, you know, in this body or black hair, what, shouldn't I have the right to choose everything about my life, not only just where I live and, and uh, things like that. And so online you could be anyone you wanted to be, and I think that was one of the initial attractions to it. I still think there's something about that that is uh, profound. I think everyone uh, needs spaces where they can feel no s real, kind of be um, unrestrained by your identity. I think the most, forget about, forget about the government, forget about corporations, it's like identity is the most constraining thing. You know, like, I am a man, this is how I have to act, I'm a woman, by far. Yeah. Um, so it's a wonder, 
I think it's really a wonderful thing to have some environments. The problem with those environments is they're extremely hard to maintain, as you descriptive with the, with the trolls. Um, you know, Freud's theory in civilization and its discontents was that uh, you know, essentially civilization would uh, disintegrate without uh, some forms of repression. And the late 90s, internet was kind of, and early 2000s, AOL was kind of sort of a demonstration, at least of that theory, because anonymous sites that aren't run well, they, they kind of collapse the frame wars, trolling, people go crazy and, you know, they become kind of toxic spaces as yeah. opposed to... So I think, I think we need anonymous spaces. I think they're really challenging to maintain. My own approach to this, if you're curious, uh, <laughs> is I like to go deep into nature, personally. Okay. I think you... I, I like the sense that if you are, like, in the woods for a very long time, you, you do sort of start to shed your identity other than you need to eat or sleep. But, you know, that's my own approach. I, but I, I think, uh, here's a recommendation. If you have a chance to spend like a week by yourself in, in nature somewhere, it's not a bad thing to do. It doesn't seem, it's not a huge amount of time, right? But it's amazing how, uh, let's say it's infrequent that people have, have done that. So it's been a week, absolutely. I, desert, ideally, of course. That's the classic biblical version. Yeah, that's the passage. Um, you can fast for a while. This way of diet. Um, okay, so you're talking about these spaces where people can express themselves, and in particular people have used like Reddit and 4chan. Yeah. And what do you think is the merit of sites like Reddit for, number one, credibility in terms of information, mm -hmm. and number two, even I guess from like a, a business model kind of sense, a lot of small owners will use Reddit to advertise their products. Yeah. And a few of them have been super successful. Now do you think that's a fluke or do you think that's something that is inherent from this type of like online forum? Um, so I like Reddit. Uh, I think it's uh, fun and you know it obviously occasionally veers towards the absurd but that's kind of the, the I think it's one of the few like healthy places left on the on the web. The fact that people have been uh, I think it's better for those places to be non-commercial. I mean I think that a lot of what I've described as ruining the web is just basically commercial forces. So that's my general answer, is that there's very few spaces that are no longer commercial. You know, there's, I was, I opened this book with the, uh,